I am reading day 14 from A Gracious Face. And the name of this essay, this is one of my favorites to be honest, is Don't Take It to Heart. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Don't take it to heart when your efforts are underappreciated. Your investment is long-term. The results will come in spurts or show themselves after years go by. Don't take it to heart when your children are bored or they tell you they hate homeschooling. It's a feeling in the moment shared with you because you are the safe place and the one in charge. Hold space for the feeling, but also hold space for homeschool. Sometimes the expression of frustration will subside as they feel heard and supported. Don't make big changes after single outbursts. Stick with your plan, but offer compassion, support, and breaks. Don't take it to heart when you try your best to apply principles that work for everyone else, but aren't working for you. It's not you, or rather, it is you. You matter. What works for you? Those principles and practices that ensure peace, progress, and passion. Check in with yourself and look for signs of life. Don't expect cookie cutter results applying someone else's practices and principles. Always find your own or your version of the ones you admire. Don't take it to heart when you have a bad day or a bad week or a bad month. We all go through dips and swings into the muddy places. Be good to you. Slow down. Take a breath. Regroup and start again. If the dips and slides last longer than a month, pay attention. Discover the cause. But do so free of self-loathing or judgment. Solve the puzzle, not the crime. You aren't bad or wrong just depleted and banged up. Don't take it to heart when the email or forum post stings and zings, pops your bubble and misses the spirit of who you are. Online communication lacks emotional cues and gives too much permission to the expression of harsh feeling. Sip tea. Read the comment. Delete it or click out. Move on. You have too much to do and too many people to love to give that one invisible person power to disrupt your harmony. Don't take it to heart when the progress you counted on doesn't emerge. You have time. There is always time. Time for everything you've ever needed to do under the sun. You can't live as though there is no time. That posture squeezes the joy from living and hurries little people who can't be hurried and robs learning of its incubation and saturation stages. Be picky. Choose one thing at a time and trust it to teach everything. Don't take it to heart when things go wrong, when you feel inadequate when you are misunderstood, when you can't find your way. That's just today. It's just a moment. It will pass. The kind of person who takes all these things to heart, a really good person with a big heart. That's you. Be good to you. Quote of the day. I just went from feeling like a big fat failure to feeling like a person with a really big heart. Thank you. Michelle Dwyer. Sustaining thought. When things go awry, don't take it to heart. Instead, give your heart a big hug. Okay, let's take a deep breath on that one. So who's been taking it to heart? <laughs> Who's been saying, shoot, there's not enough time. Somebody's mad at me. My kids don't like all the hard work I'm putting in. 
Hello, London. Hello, UK. Don't take it to heart. One of the things that I know from a long-term relationship to homeschooling and parenting and online life is that it is very, very easy to take in what other people are doing and then to allow it to be the yardstick of how you live today. And that can come from really unsuspecting places. It isn't always a spouse or a child. It isn't even always the local community. It can be invisible pressure you create for yourself by what you choose to read, by whose work you choose to follow. And what you need to create for yourself is a space where you get to decide for you, where participation in the community isn't dependent on whether or not you're towing a certain line. Not only that, sometimes things really are going wrong. Like occasionally something is actually going wrong in your family. And the solution isn't to double down, to make everybody conform, to suspish nefarious mo sus suspect, suspicious, there's a great word. The, the, don't suspect nefarious motives on the part of your children. Where you see pain, there is a cause of pain. And pain in children is expressed differently than the way you sometimes expect to see it. No child of eight or 10 is going to come to you and articulately express, you know, mom, yesterday when you switched to the new program, I panicked, I felt nervous. I was comfortable with this old one. Now you've put me in a context that feels unfamiliar. No one's gonna say that at eight. They're gonna say, do I have to? I'm so bored, this one's dumb. That's pain, that's anxiety, that's fear. So don't take the judgment to heart. That is a small child doing the best they can with the tools available to get your attention. Don't take it to heart, but you can take it seriously. And you can regroup, you can ask, oh, I know this is new. What, what aspect of it are you reacting to? Can we talk about that a little more? I wanna understand why yesterday you had a lot of energy and today, rah! because when you show curiosity, you will help your children learn how to dig deeper, to tell you the truth. When you show judgment, you train them how to keep lying and obfuscate their actual feelings. It's that easy. So don't take it to heart. Oh, 13, 14 year olds. Ah, oh, so challenging. Oh, honey. <laughs> oh, honey. So let's talk about that. Here's something I'll tell you. I was one of those moms. I home birthed my kids and they were all great home births. I breastfed my kids and breastfeeding went great. I have a home business. I live in a house all the time. I'm all about the home experience. I slept with my babies. I carried them on my body. I had wonderful little conversations. I was a nurturer. So I thought I'll slide right into that teen life. I'm not gonna have the problems other people have had with their teens because boom, I dialed it in. We're close. <laughs> Boy, the last laugh is on me. Hormones have fun with parents. And here's what happens when they hit that teen year thing. I've written about this extensively and you can find more stuff about teens on my blog. I occasionally talk about it in my books. I've done periscopes on teens, so go look for that stuff. But here's what I'll tell you just as a perfect fit for today's essay. Teens don't want to be close to you for part of their teen life. And that was a blow to my ego. I didn't expect it. It's not that they don't love you. And it's also not that they aren't close to you. It's that for the first time, they are figuring out who they are without you. And they are going to spend 13 to 20 telling themselves, yep, I can be an adult. And the only way they fully know that is if they aren't 
totally reliant on you for everything. They toggle between, I need a mommy, I hate having a mommy. I need a mommy, I hate having a mommy. But it shows up then in this very uncomfortable way, which is sullenness, eye rolls, occasional moodiness, um, arguing for no reason, also being very didactic about what they think is true. They also, for the first time, are consulting information that isn't through your filter, and they're discovering that you don't know everything, that some of what you told them isn't true. And it isn't because you've been lying, it's because you've been sharing a perspective. And they're finding out that there are other perspectives that are worth reading, understanding, and possibly holding. And while they make that transition, they are aware that they are breaking a silent family rule that says, Family members all think this way. So for a teen, imagine you've got hormones raging, you're exploring ideas that are not the family system, and you want some evidence that you can survive without them. All that's going on, and it shows up in this teen, not yet developed way, which is, oh, do I have to have my siblings around when my friends come over? And Mom, that is so dumb, I can't believe you still think that. And you've never heard that word, or worse, what did you just say that word is so ridiculous, nobody says catty corner anymore. Yeah, that happened in my family. It is still a joke. They really believed that that word didn't exist, and that I was making it up, and that I was, you know, an old fogey for using it. So that's what happens. Now, teens are incredible. Teens are absolutely incredible. They return you to a different part of yourself in the same way that a little child returns you to wonder, like you notice ladybugs again, you'd forgotten they even existed and suddenly you're pausing every three feet to look at ladybugs. Teens remind you of passion, mission, sensuality. They remind you of this other self that you sort of put on the shelf while you were a parent of small children. If you can allow yourself to enter into that with them, you will find that it is a really enriching and expanding and super fun time. I mean, now they can do stuff, you know, like if you surf, your teens can surf with you. If you ski, your teens will ski better than you did. If you like to travel, your teens are going to want to grab the map out of your hand and take you where you need to go. So that's the excitement of teens. They're going to perform and be a part of you know, sports teams and marching bands and on stage, and they're going to thrill you with this set of skills that they have developed all the time when they were little. But yeah, there is that challenge. So don't take it to heart. Don't take it to heart. Allow yourself to recognize that they're as close to you as ever. It's just being expressed now through this new experience. Is it just me or do we still secretly feel this a little with our parents even at 40? Haley, that's true. Because the thing is this, and I have it going on right now. I've got two kids living in foreign countries. My daughter Johanna lives in Nicaragua and Katrin currently lives in France. Katrin moved to France in August. The last time I talked to her on the phone or on any kind of oral phone, you know, in Skype, Facebook Live, whatever, was July. It's like maybe the first weekend of August, but she has not called me once. We communicate, Facebook message. Uh, she tags me in Facebook posts that she thinks I would like to read, and I'm going to see her in October. But she hasn't called me. She wants to do France. She wants to do France. And, if, and, and it's easy, so easy for me to take it personally, only because I miss her. And I have to remind myself, when I lived in France, and we didn't even have the ability to do phone calls, and yeah, I wrote some letters, but I didn't write my mother every day, I wrote my boyfriend every day. That's who I wanted to connect with. When I had spare change to make a two minute call, I called him, I didn't call my mom. Because that's what you're like at 18, 19, and 20, right? So, it helps to kind of remember who you are. But let's just go back to some of these categories because it's not just teens. Let's talk about the internet because right now is probably one of the more volatile internet moments of the year for Americans. 
Um, and there's a reason. We're in this election season. And people you thought you knew are saying things that don't resonate with you. Um, we're in a moment of crisis between what we understand about the police force and what we understand about the African American community. We're in crisis on a political scale internationally because of terrorism and because of Russian hackers. So a lot of emotion is showing up in the places that we're posting and reading. And it's showing up even in homeschooling discussion boards because people are reacting to all that stuff and it's stirring them up. And so when they show up in a discussion context, even if all you're talking about is the math book, there is a lot of stored energy from the zeitgeist of this moment. There is a lot of stored, I need to be heard underneath that has nothing to do with math books. It's just that it's all there. If you don't feel heard in one context in Facebook, when you switch over to the Facebook group that is talking about how to teach a certain subject and you haven't felt heard all day, you might be a little less tolerant of difference of opinion in this one place where it is usually safe for you. And the temptation might be to either lash out or to be on the receiving end of that lashing. I want to remind you that when you are in a moment culturally that is tense, it's going to show up everywhere you go online, even in places that seem like they are benign. So be aware of that. Give people some grace. Be the person who sees the human being behind the opinion. That is one way to begin to change the culture around our interactions online. But don't take any of it to heart. There is a fantastic graphic somewhere. I'll see if I can find it. I think I, think I have it on my computer and I can post it in this thread. But there's a guy sitting at a desk, furiously pounding on his keyboard. And the wife is in the hall and she says, honey, when are you coming to bed? And he says, hold on, someone is wrong on the internet. And he's just furiously typing away. The first time someone sent that to me, I died laughing. And I realized, oh my gosh, I have lived that life. That somehow, this one last communication, I'm just one conversation away from the other person getting it. If I just phrase it this one other way, they're gonna see what I see. Yeah, it doesn't really happen. You can learn a lot by reading a wide range of perspectives and inhabiting that with that person, but try not to take it to heart. Use it as research. Go into your dispassionate academic mode. Be a wool gatherer. Try to understand the passion behind the perspective. Everybody who writes with passion is protecting something. Just take that in. It's true of your kids, true of your spouse, true of your relatives. Everyone who writes with passion is protecting something. If you can figure out what they are protecting, you can strip that passage, that writing of its power. So figure out what they're protecting. And when I say protecting, it means it's the thing that's meaningful to them. It doesn't make it right or wrong. It's just, this is so meaningful to me, I have to lash out because I'm trying to protect something that seems like it's about to be ripped out of my hands. Whatever that is. You know how you feel that way sometimes with homeschool? Like you write a really passionate, you know, feeling about why public school is so horrible? Well, if your friend who is a public school mother reads that, she's going to think it's actually about public school. But what you're really doing on some level is protecting your right to homeschool and you're asking to be understood for homeschool. And you are showing why you chose homeschool. It's because, oh, public school, awful, awful. But that's not really what's behind it. If you didn't have kids in school at all, you might not even have noticed a feeling about public school. But these are your babies. These are your babies. You want to protect them. You want to protect your right to have the family life you want to have. So passion, shh, everybody's out there sharing with anger, with energy, with passion, with 
I can't believe you don't understand what I'm saying because what I'm saying is so obvious. Everybody is protecting something. And your kids do this too. They're protecting their playtime, their ability to get on the computer, the freedom to read whatever they want, to listen to music that makes them happy. And so they get angry at you about something else. They are protecting something. So next time you hear anger, think about that. Next time you hear some invalidation, think about that. What is this person protecting? And what am I not hearing? What is going on underneath? It takes a big person to do this. And I'm not here to tell you that you can do it without pain because it hurts. It hurts when people attack. It hurts when people don't listen. It hurts when people assign you motives you didn't have. Oh, I think that's my least favorite of all. When somebody tells me about me, you know, some books call that abuse. When someone tells you a lie about you, I've heard that as the definition of abuse. So yeah, that sucks. Nobody likes that. Let's circle all the way back now. Don't take it to heart. When your efforts are underappreciated, your investment is long-term. The results will come in spurts or show themselves after years go by. Don't take it to heart. When things go wrong, when you feel inadequate, when you are misunderstood, when you can't find your way, that's just today, just a moment. It will pass. The kind of person who takes all these things to heart, a really good person with a big heart, and that's you. So be good to you today. Thanks for joining me. Have a fabulous weekend. I hope the weather where you are is beautiful. Get out in it. Um, if it isn't beautiful, pull in. May, it's fall in the northern hemisphere. Maybe make some caramel apples. It is the start of spring down under. Hello, Australia. Enjoy the blossoms on your trees. Plant some flowers. Enjoy this turn of season. And I will see you on Monday at 8 a.m. where we'll continue. Live honestly. Write bravely. Love your family fiercely. I'm Julie Bogart.